afternoon, and thank you all so much for joining us for today's program. My name is Melissa Loriano, and I serve as the Programs Manager of the DC Preservation League. For those of you new to DCPL, we are a citywide nonprofit organization founded in 1971 that is dedicated to preserving, protecting, and enhancing the historic and built environment of Washington, DC through advocacy and education. So I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge some of DCPL's top sponsors whose annual financial support helps underwrite free public programs like this one today. They are the DC Commission on the Arts and Humanities, Denton's, Douglas Development, Intunovich Associates, Atlantic Refinishing and Restoration, Buyer Blender Bell, Building Innovation Hub, EHT Traceries, and KCE Structural Engineers. So many thanks to you all for your dedication to historic preservation in DC. So with that, I am so pleased to introduce you all to today's speakers. Christopher Gray was a co-founding principal of Cox Gray and SPAC Architects, which started in 1981 in Georgetown and has grown to over 30 architects and garnered over 90 regional and national design awards. He led the design effort for many of the firm's major public and private sector institutional, educational, and religious commissions. Chris's career highlight was leading the five-year, $162 million modernization of the Duke Ellington School of the Arts, which we'll be talking about today. In recent years, Chris has been able to focus more on the needs of his community around Annapolis as a regular volunteer on oyster and shoreline restoration projects. In 2018, he was invited to join the then newly elected County Executive Transition Committee to assist in establishing goals for sustainability and resiliency. He is currently assisting in several initiatives, including establishing a task force for the acquisition and adaptive reuse of the historic but long shuttered uh, Crownsville Hospital Center, assisting historic Baldwin Hall in grant funding and establishing a long-term preservation plan uh, initiating the lo location of a community solar pilot project at a vacant county property, leading the effort to fight the development of a critical 52 acres of forest adjacent to the bay. Um, and in 2021, he was invited to join the Chesapeake Bay Trust Campaign Committee to bring its headquarters and mini campus up to net zero, uh, net zero performance. Kim Daylitter, is a senior project manager and director of technical preservation services with EHT Traceries. Kim regularly manages project teams throughout the rigorous review processes by the Commission of Fine Arts, National Capital Planning Commission, and the DC Historic Preservation Office. She works on Section 106 Consultation, National Environmental uh, Protection Act, Building Preservation Plans, Historic Structure Report, uh, Historic Tax Credits, National Register Nominations, and determination of eligibility. She has regularly worked with the DC, uh, DC State Historic Preservation Office on the rehabilitation of historic schools throughout the district, including the Duke Ellington School of the Arts. Prior to work at Traceries, Kim completed a year long fellowship at the General Service Administration Public Building Service. She also completed a four month fellowship at the Frank Lloyd, uh, at Frank Lloyd Wright's uh, Falling Water. So, with that, we're going to pass things along to Christopher, thanks very much, Melissa. It's great to be with you all. Uh, it's uh, uh, exciting to present the project. Um, and uh, Melissa, I think we were going to put some rotating slides up there for you all to see as I speak. Um, but I thought it might be worthwhile to, these are just a series of stills that were bleeding from one to the next to sort of give you a taste for the project from demo here on. Uh, but also, I thought it might be um, relevant to give people a little background on on uh, Ellington. Um, it, Ellington is a unique school, as, you, as some of you may know, it's a magnet school and it gets um, city funding <clears throat> per capita. But what's unique about it is it can establish its own curriculum, uh, hire and fire teachers. Um, and its, its mission is basically to combine high school, a high school education with uh, learning professional uh, performing and uh, the fine arts. Um, so <clears throat> the, the uh, exciting part of it, of course, for us was, was engaging the, the, uh, the school and, and the administration all the way down through, um, uh, to, down to the students. Uh, the interesting thing is that it wasn't a foregone conclusion that Ellington would continue at, at, um, 
at the, its building in uh, Berleith. It's actually Berleith just over the line from Georgetown. Um, <clears throat> and some folks don't know that, uh, that, that there was a very significant lobby, including I believe the mayor, who uh, felt that uh, it needed to go down to 7th, 7th Street and the Arts District. Um, but Peggy Cooper Caverts and the, the whole uh, core behind uh, Ellington uh, felt that this was their home. They identified it with it starting in 74. Um, and I think uh, uh, they obviously won that battle uh, pretty early on. It was a, an international competition. Um, there were a few projects that, uh, that the administrator, that the DC public schools had set up as, as competitions, I think one or two before. There haven't been very many since, uh, but uh, it was an international competition, 20 firms uh, down to four. And uh, there was a stipend for each firm to, to uh, develop their designs. Uh, there were actually two options. One was to renovate the existing building. And another was to build a brand new building down the street uh, at Ellington's uh, Park and Rec Center. Uh, we chose to stay with the building because we knew that there was no way that the city was going to uh, uh, give over a recreation spot that uh, was valued by all. Uh, so we... We put all our eggs in the existing building basket, uh, so to speak, and uh, others did not. Uh, Bing Tom uh, worked on the new site. Uh, I believe David Ajay did down there as well. Uh, we stayed, as I say, close to, to the existing building. And then it turned out that uh, there was so much uh, uh, resistance to the idea of using the rec center that the administration changed the competition, started it all over again, and said, everybody has to work on the existing building which gave us the chance to refine uh, the design from a more, uh, a more restrained design to actually a more exuberant uh, and contrasting one. So we were, we were selected in that second, second round. Uh, we were a JV, LBACGS JV, and we were the design architects of the JV team. And I was a principal in charge, uh, working hand in hand with Chris Ambridge, who's our very talented uh, project architect who unfortunately couldn't join us today, but perhaps is listening uh, in his uh, visit to Homeland uh, currently in England. Uh, and then with an extensive team of consultants, uh, among them uh, was uh, is Bill Yun, who was the uh, structural engineer and held it all up, including the incredible egg, which I should add, uh, uh, Bill assured us that uh, even though it was sitting on three eggs, once the 800 seats were loaded, it wouldn't settle. It wouldn't deflect more than a quarter of an inch. And of course that made us all feel pretty good. The, uh, the unusual uh, uh, contractual relationship here was that the AE was selected first, the design was brought to schematic design and then uh, priced by bidders. And uh, it was then awarded to uh, GCS Siegel. Uh, and then they were paired with us at that point as a design build team. And really, in, in short, we couldn't accomplish this project uh, in time and under budget as we did without it having been a design build um, uh, context. So, so it, it was a very ambitious uh, to, to, to the get go. And we knew, we knew there was a tall order when we were in the competition because we had so much opportunity to, uh, to design it. Uh, but um, uh, we, you know, watch what you wish for, uh, we learned pretty quickly. Uh, that it was, uh, you know, a major effort, a massive change of program and and the technology uh, for a building that um, was approximately 160,000 square feet. We removed approximately 73,000 of secondary space uh, to make way for uh, an addition of 90,000 square feet uh, for a total building, and then rent. No, I'm sorry, we renovated 90,000 and we added 175,000. Uh, for a total project of 265,000 square feet, roughly 100,000 uh, square foot expansion. Uh, so it, uh, it was a, extremely challenging in, in that regard. Uh, and needless to say, we had to go through about as complex a review agency uh, process as anywhere in the country with, uh, with uh, HPRB, CFA, uh, the mayor's agent, uh, countless stakeholders and citizens groups. There were plenty of impediments along the way that were uh, real challenging, but we overcame them. And at the end of the day, we have what we have, which is I think a, 
I am a very proud of and I think is an extraordinary project. And EHT really helped us get through that process um, uh, um, as, as complex as it was. So let's start um, with that. You'll hear more about our project team. There'll be plenty of interviews and you'll see uh, more about the extraordinary people who uh, helped put this, uh, put this together. So let's start video, the video on the HPRB award ceremony. And this was uh, for, uh, we, we won the uh, preservation award that year. Uh, and this was our presentation at DAR Constitution Hall. How do you repurpose portions of a historical national landmark? How do you make that fit and, and yet increase the program space by 50%? The Duke Ellington High School of the Arts commands the hill where the Georgetown and Berleith neighborhoods meet. Originally built as Western High School, this DC landmark was designed by Harry B. Davis and constructed in 1898. It's actually a very significant school building for the city. It was the first purposely built high school. It had the first gymnasium, lunchroom, auditorium. Uh, the scale itself was much larger than any other school that had been built at that time. The Duke Ellington School was the vision of co-founders Peggy Cooper Kayfritz and Mike Malone, who sought to nurture DC students who have a passion for the arts. The high school is named for Edward Duke Ellington, a native Washingtonian and world-renowned band leader and composer. The school formally opened the doors to its first class in 1974. We're a dual curriculum high school, so that means we give equal measure of academics and pre-professional arts training. Today, the school is one of the top arts high schools in the country with an enrollment of 537 students. In two so a pause there, I think, if you'll excuse, uh, this gives us an opportunity to just uh, outline through a, a section, a very informative section. You can see the front bar on the right and the big portico. And then the central section, you can see where is the, is the insertion of uh, the bulk of the expansion of the project, including the lower level basement parking that we excavated down to get to. Uh, and then of course, the main theater and the fly and then to the left of that is the back bar, and you can't quite see it, but there's an addition to the back bar, uh, all, all of which were efforts to expand the, the uh, uh, curriculum dramatically uh, and the space uh, for it. 2014, an ambitious undertaking to renovate the historic school was put into motion. So our challenge was to take this historic and protected, but not in good shape, yeah, just a, a tad before that uh, to show the, the cross section, I think again is a sort of a telling slide. Uh, the, we're cutting through here, uh, all new construction. On the right is what we call the, uh, one of the saddles. On the left is the other saddle. These were infill pieces in what were open slots uh, between the front bar and the back bar. And then the, you can see in the section is the, is the core of the atrium three-sided atrium with light and uh, opening on uh, the circulation systems that surrounded it on every floor, uh, plus the theater in the middle and the uh, roof terrace above. And then you can see the parking level that was added. And on the lower right is a special performance space, black box behind it and a, a special performing uh, smaller venue for the school. And then that, very much at the bottom, you, down at the Below the actual uh, garage slab are the uh, the cistern, rain, gray water cistern tanks. But not in good shape facility and dramatically upgraded to today's technology and put in a program that was extremely ambitious. The $160 million undertaking included new construction to accommodate performance and rehearsal spaces. State-of-the-art classrooms were woven into and around an extensive restoration of the historic structure. Yeah, and another last pause, I think. <laughs> uh, maybe not, one more. Uh, but this one, I think, is, is illustrative of the extent of the, of the demolition of actually the front bar, the historic part, which had uh, really poorly constructed windows somewhere circa 80s. Uh, that were not in good shape and they had fake muttons and things like that. And you can see through these openings, 
this where you're standing in what, what will be the new media center and you're looking out onto the terrace uh, above a port in the portico above the entrance and the lobby that was just uh, for decades and decades was just a roof you couldn't even get to it uh, so we opened that up we finished it off waterproofed it paved it uh, and and uh, provided generous doors out to it from the media center to capture a completely new space that they'd never uh, had before. And is, is a wonderful, uh, provides a wonderful opportunity for many different events. Part of the restoration project involved actually removing elements that have been added and putting back elements that were originally there. So different parts of the building required a different level of focus uh, or attention to its, its history. We carved out a, a 10,000 square feet of space in the middle, four stories high, and through that we brought light right down into the middle of the building. Suspended in the middle of the school's atrium is a state-of-the-art 800-seat theater aptly named the egg. There are so many different things in this school that other schools don't have. All of the sound booths and the band rooms and the technology centers. So many things that don't exist in a, in, in a normal um, school. After a three-year renovation, students and administrators return for the 2017-2018 school year to a LEED Gold certified facility. Well, I witnessed my... Just a little before that one. Last pause, I apologize. But I, I thought this was an opportunity also to, to illustrate uh, a component of the project that was really quite interesting, came towards the end of the project, which was utilizing DC's Percent for Art program, uh, of which the, uh, there's a tax uh, throughout the, the uh, city for, uh, to go towards art projects for each school. Ellington was, allow was a allowed, I think, a $500,000 uh, a limit. We went beyond that, of course, because uh, Peggy Cooper Caferts and others uh, wanted to see much more significant art. So you see that sculpture in the, uh, that beautiful sculpture hanging in the lobby there in the opening and down low in the underneath the balcony or the, of the uh, bridge, you can see Yes Laud. Uh, that was a wonderful pixelated piece of art. These are just one of uh, two of, of six or eight, all of which were integrated uh, into the architecture. By, by engaging us as the architects in what they would do and where they would be located to complement the architecture rather than compete with it. Well, I witnessed myself with a reaction. A lot of them came screaming and crying. I can't believe, is this our school? Wow, you know, one kid even says, I don't want to graduate next year, you know? I want to spend that, I want to redo the year. So everybody, everybody was, was absolutely thrilled. What they found was the best technology that was to be had, was spaces, classroom spaces that were conducive to learning and malleable. It was like Dorothy in the Emerald City, right? It was just incredible. So the next uh, next piece we'll show you is the submission, 2014 submission uh, to HPRB. Uh, and the project still went through uh, some refinements with HPRB. I, I lost count how many times we met with them, Kim. <laughs> uh, but they were they integral partners in the process. And, you know, part of part of getting what the school wanted obviously meant that we we had to negotiate with them and and work hand in hand with them to to come up with a design solution that that worked so i think this is a very seminal diagram this was basically the concept from day one at the competition mm -hmm. uh, and, and it and it it followed through to the design that that we know now uh, the upper left is the school as it was red is what we took out uh, and then uh, we went down a, a level to the, the orange level to get the uh, parking level. And then the blue are the saddles and the back, back bar addition. And then of course the egg uh, set down gently into the 10,000 square foot atrium. That was the essential concept from day one. And uh, it, it, it 
got adjusted here and there. Uh, the fly, for example, didn't work uh, the existing one as much as we'd hoped. So we had to uh, uh, work with that. Anyway, slide three. And, and these are the sections that, uh, that are, are expressing the existing theater and how inadequate it was. It was, it was designed for a high school, not a uh, pre-professional performing arts uh, uh, school. And so with the, and the fly didn't work. So we really worked hard to try to figure out uh, what, what it, size and scope it needed to be and a couple of things we ended up doing was re reducing the fly, as you see on the lower right, uh, the height of the fly somewhat. We, we had a wish list for how high it could be, but HPRB uh, wanted it lower. And we ended up actually finding ways to use three sides of the original uh, fly and just move the front. That wasn't a little thing. And then, and then add 12 feet to it. Um, so thanks, Chris. I will take over for a little bit. Um, so, you know, Duke Ellington really did evolve over the course of 27 years. You can see the evolution happen in, in the bottom um, diagrams uh, from its first conception in 1898 to the last historic alteration in 1925. Over this long period, there were many changes to the historic facade, and you can see the vast difference between what it looked like originally versus what we think of that front bar looking like today. We'll get into further detail later, but a significant original features are these um, entrance porches uh, flanking the main portico of the building. Um, they had been removed and lost over time. Um, and that, that was a significant issue that came up throughout this process and discussing things with HPRB and HPO. And those, those were actually boys and girls entrances as is very traditional right. back, in the, back in the day. Um, and I, I would say that that was one of the significant trading things that we worked out with HPRB, that there was so much demolition, which in fact was more than the, co than the preservation code allowed. Uh, we had to go for a, a special exception through the mayor's agent, uh, but we balanced, we were able to balance the amount of demo uh, with uh, the, the, re, uh, replic the restoring of things that were missing. For example, those, those uh, porticos those are school entrance pieces and the whole facade uh, treatment and steps, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Mm -hmm. So the original building was small compared to the extant school, but at the time, as that video said, that it was one of the largest schools DC had ever built and was the first purpose-built high school in the district. Um, you know, architect Harry B. Davis uh, was the first one to incorporate gymnasium, library, assembly hall, um, and chemistry, botany, and physics dedicated laboratories um, that had never been thought to put into a schoolhouse before. If we, we can move on to the next slide. The first major alteration in addition came in 1910 when Snowden Ashford installed the now iconic deep portico at the front and expanded both the north and south wings to add 12 new classrooms and three new laboratories. A fire in the roof uh, occurred in 1915 and gave Ashford a second chance at altering the building. At this time, he fully removed those boys and girls porches at the entrances. Um, and then he also added four additional classrooms to the rear of the building. That's the diagram in the top right. And then only 10 years later, a third major expansion was necessary. Albert L. Harris added a significant addition to the rear with 18 new classrooms, the new theater, which is what the existing theater was when we started this project, and two new gymnasiums. He was also responsible for adding the first entrance at the central arch at the base of the portico. You can see that in the um, second to the left hand bottom corner photograph. Uh, before this, the entrances were still at those former historic boys and girls porches. Um, and then in 1985, architect Arthur Cotton Moore significantly rehabilitated the school's interior. And I'll let Chris give a little bit more detail on that. Yeah, and, and actually I think that design and period, I think our sensitivities matured architecturally about how to treat buildings, especially historic ones, let alone landmark buildings. Uh, and, I, and I think even in 85, Arthur Cotton Moore didn't, didn't get it. Uh, uh, and really at that, in that period, uh, I would say a lot of the original fabric inside 
was removed. And you can see Arthur had his uh, curve or his curve template out and a lot of new things happening, uh, you know, dynamic in their day, but uh, disruptive, I would say, in terms of um, the sense of the original architecture. And we'll see some and another example of that in the front in, in, in a little bit. So let's move on. So as there were so many large construction efforts and each executed by a significant architect in their own right, it was really up to the project team to decide what era we should restore the exterior and that front bar to. Uh, we had many discussions with HPO and CFA as to what would be the most appropriate. Uh, we couldn't take off Ashford's iconic portico um, and restore it to Davis's original one, but we did want to bring back some of the features of Davis's design that had been lost. And that's where these entrance porches come in. So we can move on to the next. Um, so it was determined that the point of significance of design for that front portion of the school would be 1910. It allowed for the restoration of both those porches and the return of the original ballast roof balustrade that had been removed sometime between 1932 and 1944. You can see it on the picture in the bottom left, um, kind of on the top of the, the school. It was an original Davis feature as well. Um, in the top right hand corner, you can see that roof balustrade um, in the original 1898 building. Um, we can go to the next. So it was originally thought that that Ashford had removed the balustrade after the roof fire, which you can see in the photograph top left. Um, but a uh, photograph kind of research helped us pinpoint that date to actually after 1932. Um, so it, we were happy to, to figure out when that feature was removed and to put it back to the school. Um, another significant feature that went through an evolution was the prominent front lawn of the school, which is really very welcoming um, and has always been a significant part of its history. Um, Davis's original design on the bottom left, uh, yeah, bottom left, um, had straight paths angled out to the corners of the squares. But by 1903, the landscape had been softened to the now arching pathways that have been on the school ever since. So we can see here that the landscape um, in 1910, 1925, 1965 um, was really fairly consistent um, until the 1985 Moore renovation. A flagpole was added in 1910, but only minimal changes occurred over the next 65 years. In 85, Moore, Moore added entrances under all the arches in the portico, not just the central arch, um, and he included a central wide stair in front of that portico uh, with flanking ADA ramps. And I'll let Chris discuss this in further detail on the next slide. Yeah, and I, on the upper left, uh, that was the more intervention with the uh, matching ADA ramps on either side and a very beefy pier with a, with a huge uh, uh, vessel on top. Uh, that that really just didn't fit. Uh, it seemed uh, an affront, so to speak, in terms of competing with the original architecture. So th those were history pretty early on. And uh, again, it was all worked out with HPRB trying to get back to what what was uh, original construction. We read it we, another another sort of horse trade, shall we say, for the amount of demolition that we ultimately uh, needed to do and the expansion of new construction, uh, we, the, we agreed that it would be restored back to the original stair and portico entrances. At one point, we even had a student entrance, you'll see later on uh, at that point, and decided that um, that was not uh, the best place to put it, and that, that was another change. But basically, these, these interventions were uh, removed and new uh, and, and original design restored. So there were um, a couple other landscape features uh, on the property that were significant. Uh, the first was the um, Boone plaque that was added in 1926 up here in the top right corner. Um, it was donated by the Daniel Boone Trail Association, but the plaque on the stone was actually stolen in the 1980s. Uh, so part of the restoration was to recreate and reinstall the missing plaque. 
Um, then on the bottom left was the Veterans Memorial. And of course, the um, very famous green chair was also re retained and restored. <clears throat> so of significant discussion among the project team, as we mentioned briefly earlier, was the 1925 theater designed by Harris. Not only did the theater fall outside of the point of significance agreed to restore the building to, which ended up being 1910, but it had also been heavily altered by Arthur Cotton Moore's 1985 renovation. Um, I'll let Chris explain a little bit more detail the alterations that happened in that 85 renovation. Yeah, so uh, the I think the next series of slides will illustrate for you how we went back to HPRB to show them what changes we had made to address concerns or, or contributions that they added to a previous submittal. So you'll see a, a kind of a before, this was our last submittal, and here's our current solution. So they could see easily what uh, changes we were making and how we were address, addressing comments. But this aerial or this view looking down uh, is very much what, what we have today. Uh, it's not as ambitious a, a rooftop terrace. We called it the sky view terrace at the time. And it certainly was a, a, a major element that got everybody really excited. You'll see some other 3Ds of it. Um, the neighborhood uh, ended up getting a hold of that and uh, fighting it tooth and nail. So it got, uh, because they were worried about noise transmission, which I think we, we proved to them or thought we had proved to them that it wouldn't be an issue buried as deep as it is in the plan of the building. Uh, but nevertheless, it got uh, reduced. And obviously that saved some dollars because there were VE efforts that had to be made on the project. Uh, and then the whole front evolution, as Kim was saying, the curving uh, sidewalk, uh, we had a, a, a series of plazas that, that um, were not as original, shall we say, as the, initially as, as the uh, original design was, uh, and that got changed. So let's go to the next slide. Um, and here's, here's an example of where uh, up, upper right, we started, as I mentioned earlier, that the students actually would go down into the lower level and come out at the floor of the atrium uh, because Ellington wanted students separated from public. And we didn't have, initially, we felt we needed more room to bring in 600 students, uh, but we found a way, uh, to, and, that, and this was not a popular idea with um, HBRB, and we felt like perhaps it was not as honest to the original concept as it should be. So that mo moved into the solution you see on the lower right, uh, and this, at this point, we had agreed we were going to restore those girls and boys porches, entrance uh, porches, and that would be the, the way in which students would arrive. Next slide. And so here's a, a, a view of the new entrance for the students coming into the replicated um, portico or, or porch entrance, the, the original stairs and whole sequence to the front of the portico, all, all new, uh, but, but replicating what was there originally. And of course we had to negotiate issues of ramps and all of those good things and tried to integrate those as aesthetically as we could. One thing you see in the upper picture that you won't see for long is what we call the lantern, which the concept was, you know, what, would we, what, what could we propose that would expand the library's uh, needs uh, and you know, and yet use open space in the portico. So that was called the lantern. It was a very sophisticated glassy uh, element. I think that's in the next slide where there's more on it. Yeah, so, so the lantern was the concept there was a, an extremely glassy element uh, set into the behind the portico adjacent to the media center, which you could come out and have a very lovely uh, uh, semi-outdoor reading room and then a, an outdoor area around that. That again, it was, I think it probably might've gotten support from HBRB and others if we kept on pushing it, but basically they said, you know what, we could live without that. And, uh, and again, it was a very expensive, sophisticated portion of the building. We let it go, and, uh, and, but still renovated that portico to become a, a lovely outdoor space at the end of the day. Excellent. It, and there, there was a section through it showing, you know, the concept of how that worked. It would have been pretty neat, 
Uh, but, you know, did the project hinge on it? No. And I'm gonna go through these plans pretty quickly, but, and they've changed somewhat uh, from, from this iteration in 14 to what, what was opened up in 17. But this is that lower level uh, part of the negotiation on the project was you need to provide parking for your faculty and staff uh, and not on Georgetown streets. Uh, and you can't put it on the lawn. <laughs> so uh, that forced us to excavate about six feet down lower uh, than was there and insert a parking garage and then build the new deck above that. So that's what this level was primarily for. There was also archive storage for art and Ellington has a pretty robust art collection, probably worth about 5 million or more. And these were conditioned storage spaces, uh, some curatorial space, things like that. Next slide. And as you come up, now you're on the floor of the atrium and you can see the three columns that the egg sits on. Uh, and then at that point, we had a spiraling stair coming down from above. We changed that to simplify it. But this was sort of the heart and soul of the, the uh, centerpiece of the building. Everything sort of spiraling around that. And the big box spaces, I would call them, uh, we, we couldn't weave those into existing building fabric in the front and the back bar very easily. So uh, most of those spaces are accommodated in the new saddles above and below on that plan. And the back the back bar addition, uh, all of those wide, tall spaces uh, worked well there, okay? And another floor up. Now this is the entrance floor. Um, and you can see how we utilize that porch entrance for the students in the, just, just north of the lobby so that the students could come in uh, and go through security and flow into the facility separate from the public. As, a, as you may know, they, they have four or five productions a year, at least, uh, and the public is invited into uh, the, on that main staircase into the portico window doors and up into the uh, atria, the, uh, the lobby prior to the impact of, of sort of seeing for now, for, for the first time really, the, the egg in the atrium. And then you see the new fly behind that and the addition, the back bar addition uh, and to the, to the uh, th this, this was a design thing that changed, for example, on that lower bottom of the plan was the uh, small performance space. We ended up saving dollars by moving that up the sheet on the other side of the building and, and depressing that uh, plus the black box down into the ground. Uh, and, and I think that, that saves valuable upper level natural lit space uh, for other purposes. Next slide. And uh, just in, again, going up, the, the media center that we talked about on the middle right uh, was a central space. Uh, and then uh, surrounding all of this were the various many different departments from dance to vocal to uh, uh, academic spaces, primarily in the front bar, uh, the, choir, the choir room, uh, which had tiered seating in it, uh, every, every kind of uh, uh, space that you could imagine for uh, practice and performance, including, I believe, 20 or 21 uh, very sophisticated sound booths uh, that you could practice one or more people in with uh, the fully, fully uh, uh, technology uh, provided. And now we're at the very top of the egg, as you see, that's that mezzanine up at the way back. Uh, I wouldn't call it a nosebleed, but it was pretty high up and, a, and an exciting part of the theater to be in. Uh, and then the continuing surrounding of, of academic spaces, dance, uh, uh, all sorts of various uh, functioning spaces. The arts were up in the upper section there, art rooms and um, uh, ceramics and things like that. And then we're up on the roof now. Again, this, this changed quite a bit. This actually had a mezzanine to it, which was utilizing the space adjacent big box spaces that uh, for, for smaller, lower sp level spaces that we could um, put additional space on, uh, but that ended up getting BE'd out of the project. So there was no quote fourth mezzanine level. The only thing that was uh, finally up at the top was the terrace, okay, which is here. And then we had green roofs. Uh, all, we, we couldn't put the solar in that area that you see on the upper right because it turned out that we could not, the existing building structure could not support that load. And um, 
so uh, we, we moved uh, the solar, we found a system that combines solar and, and green roof and set it up uh, as green roof now, uh, future solar later as the funding uh, was, was uh, found. And in that front bar, I don't know if I said this earlier, but we found a two story space in the front bar that was completely unutilized. And we ab were able to insert a floor in between that tall space, a lightweight floor. And we put 15,000 square feet of mechanical uh, within the building envelope without you knowing it's there. Go ahead. Again, just examples of where we made changes to the, to the building design, uh, previous above, uh, you know, current below, it, pretty subtle changes, reducing the fly, for example, things like that, some color changes. Uh, well, and then the major one between the above and the bottom is moving that student center entrance up and uh, being more, more historically referenced on the entrance to the portico. Next slide. And again, you can see differences in terms of colors and materials and things like that, that, we, that evolved. Go ahead. And one thing, major thing that did change was this whole breeze delay that, that we envisioned uh, on, on, the back, on the back bar over the terraces of that, um, pretty, pretty bold <laughs> and uh, did, didn't fly. Um, and then the other thing, big change was you might see in the design of the addition, uh, it was actually curving in two directions, uh, vertically and horizontally. And it turned out that was exceedingly expensive and difficult to uh, pull off. So uh, keep going. The, uh, the building evolved as, as, as we started, started to figure out how to build it and, and what the materials were. It continued to evolve, next slide, um, into uh, a straight, straight side, as you see on the, on the uh, uh, current, current, this current design. And this is where, uh, this was a study on, on sight lines to, to confirm what, what you could see from where. Very tight neighborhood here in Georgetown, uh, residential right on top of you. So the residences and sight lines and noise and all that had always been issues there. Uh, and we had to solve not only those as best we could, but, but uh, mitigate the uh, size of the expansion and height. Next slide. And aerial kind of gives you a sense for what, what were the major components. Again, this is, this is back a ways, uh, but it's, it's pretty, pretty similar to what that is now, just not as extravagant a rooftop. Next slide. Viewed from the back, you can see the back bar addition. Uh, and, and these were our ways of, of going, you know, adding 100,000 square feet to the project. Go ahead. Okay, and the materials board showing them what our pieces of uh, components were and what the colors and so on. The original building we, we perceive was always white. Uh, it had been uh, uh, stripped at some point, a portion of it back in the Moore when Moore was working on it, but we ended up all agreeing that it was a white building, at least for most of its life. And we wanted to go back to that, to that sort of purity and clarity of that color. Next slide. And just some, some aerials. And again, these I think give you a sense for how, that, how those slots were filled in between the front and the back bar uh, and how, how sort of insignificant those elements were. Uh, and then the, the old theater in the middle. Uh, so those were the components that uh, allowed us the opportunity to carve out existing structure and, and infilling new. Next slide. Again, a section. Um, that, that I think uh, this is probably the one I could show you on that two story. If you see academic classroom, the words there in the sort of the upper part of the front bar, that black box, that back black area was the two story space roughly uh, in, in between the academic classroom and the rooftop of the portico. And that was that uh, wonderful space that we captured and, and were able to hide and, and locate all of the HVAC, which was very sophisticated in this project and not take up valuable classroom space uh, or add to the building envelope to accomplish that. Next slide. So 
Is that the end? <laughs> okay. I guess that's the end. No, it's, I'm sorry. Maybe I'm, I think we're on 37 now. It's not showing up. Cooperating. Yeah, I have 42 slides. Yeah, do you guys not see 37? I see 37. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. Are we? So keep going. Okay. There you go. That that that's a mm -hmm. a pretty cool 3D of what that sky uh, the sky view terrace would have felt and looked like, and and this was a real uh, rendition of what the view would be with the Washington Monument and and Kennedy Center, etc. Uh, but it it and it, and it was as I said a major selling point of our design was what what was going to happen up there, projecting as well on the onto the fly. Well, that 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 hit. Uh, a brick wall, as I've already said, uh, and, and had to get dramatically downscaled. Some interior views. Back then it was a, a wood clad uh, egg. And uh, again, that was another VE. It turned out it was just too complex to, to figure out how to do that, uh, accomplish that technically time-wise in dollars. Uh, so we did a, what I would call a Venetian plaster approach that looks uh, as it does now, quite lovely. Go ahead, more views. Again, very similar to what we have, just different finishes and, and, and some, of the, some of the aesthetics. And then as, as Kim mentioned, the historic landscape was very historic. We, we were very much required to research that, find out what its history and evolution was. And to the extent that we could blend its, uh, uh, the new with the old, uh, we spend a lot of time looking at that, working with lab uh, on, on that next slide, and then coming up with uh, quite a lovely a landscape plan that still left that wonderful front lawn wide open, uh, which is a place the kids love to play, have always played there. Uh, it's, it's the one open space that you have on the campus, sh short of going down the street to the rec center. Okay, I think that is the end of this group. So the last video, let's, uh, let's let that roll. We are a school that was created for access for students who typically didn't have access to the arts. Because we are a public school, we take kids at any academic level, as long as they have artistic aptitude. You learn how to be a professional, you learn how to collaborate, you learn how to run the world. Ellington has always had this hundred million dollar program. We just didn't have a building that matched. Before we were Ellington, this building was Western, which was the neighborhood school for Ward 2. Mike Malone, Peggy Cooper Kayfritz were looking for a building to support their workshops for careers in the arts. And because the enrollment was so low, they were like, here, you can have the building, and we are still critically important to the black and brown community today. Michael Malone, Peggy Cooper Kafer's teenagers, just young people during a time where the country was battling racial injustice, sort of like now, these two young people said, I am going to see my way through this, and I'm going to create an opportunity for people who look like me. That then became the Duke Ellington School of the Arts. The building's a landmark, it's old, but it wasn't a preserved building. It had been renovated, pieces had been ripped apart, pieces had been added throughout its 100-year life to that one, more than 100 years. Definitely parts of the building didn't always feel like, you know, is there, is there mold happening here? What is this water? So there were just structural things that were happening. The gym had to become the dance studio. The auditorium had to constantly go through these different iterations to fit the needs of the performing arts department. The building was dictating the need for growth from day one. As beautiful as it is, and it's a beautiful building, the building behind it's not necessarily this thing that's ready for you just to add another story to. It takes a lot of kind of remedial work to bring an 1890s building into the 21st century. When we decided to renovate, it was really a partnership collaboration with the government that this should be an international competition, which speaks to Ellington. While we are in Washington, D.C., we are global ambassadors for the arts. That's just who we are. A lot of the designers who presented designs to us, they were fabulous. David Ajay, who built the um, Museum for African American Culture and History, he was one of the people. He did a fabulous job. But no one 
really captured the essence like this team. Not just the essence of you know, a brand new building, the essence of the people who were already here. The first video they showed us, it sold us. The contemporary side of it, the historic side of it, the brilliance of how to make this building work for the students, but still feel like it's home. There were black people in the video. That was important, because I wanted them to hear that, you know? Representation is important. No one ever spoke about it. I don't think we spoke about it, I don't think they spoke about it, but we saw it. This was Chris Gray and his team doing what I think every architect firm should do if you're working with a client, sit back and listen. I had a call from my boss telling me that we'd won the competition. I was kind of on cloud nine, I think, and then there was this realization, oh my goodness, we've got to build this thing. I was very familiar with Archicad as a piece of software. I'd even dabbled in the 3D elements of it, but I'd never used it as a BIM workflow. And so aware of the challenges ahead of us in terms of the, the geometrical complexity of what we were trying to achieve, especially the theater, we've got to do this fully as a BIM project in Archicad. My instinct was to model something in 3D because I felt that it would be the easiest way to get to the 2D outcome. Especially for the theater, the model was shared out to the steel detailer, the folks in Minneapolis that made the curved light gauge framing so that they could see what we were looking at, see what Chris had designed, see what the clearances were, see the parts and pieces that had to fit in that they weren't directly involved with, all those pieces coming together. Chris kind of knew what all these parties were doing with the model. So it was kind of up to him to put it all back together as a consolidated, useful, accurate, vetted thing. So, for instance, with the structural steel, the structural engineer and myself worked together to create a steel model inside of Archicad. We then sent that out to the steel detailer who used it to develop their more detailed fabrication model. But then they sent it back in IFC format. We imported it into our model. So we made our steel one color, we made their steel another color, and you could immediately see if they were overlapping perfectly or whether they were off or not. We had just had parts and pieces for all the steel and all these parts on flat 2D plans. It would have been impossible to understand if it was going to work and just how it was supposed to come together. Most guys had never done it before. Just never seen that kind of way of doing a job. It was just really, really fantastic. If you were here 10 years ago, didn't know about the renovations, you would think it's the same building. But then you come in and you realize, wait a minute, we moved from 100,000 square feet to 200,000 square feet. How did that happen? The front bar had to be attached to the theater, which was a brand new complex curving structure, which then had to be attached to the back bar, which was an existing two-story structure that we added two additional stories to that we had to sleeve new steel through. We ended up doing a point cloud of the back bar, all the existing conditions, turning that into a model and then having that model fed into the Archicad model. Being able to see that in 3D and being able to look at it in, in more than one dimension or two dimensions was essential. There's a detail where the, the shell, the side, the addition meets the back bar that on a lot of projects would have been like the toughest detail to get, right? Where that intercepts, waterproofing it, there's a little flat land behind it, and you're coming up with new above it, so it's new and old meeting, you gotta get the envelope to work. But yeah, you know, that would have been like the big thing to figure out on a lot of projects. It was one of a litany of things we figured out on this project. So once you get into the frontier of technology, some pretty cool stuff starts happening. We wanted the users of the building to appreciate the heritage that they had in the original building. Probably the most significant part of that is the front side of the atrium where we've expressed the original brick wall. It was important to us that we retained that original kind of textured brick surface. We've actually kept a couple of the historic window openings that have now become mechanical louvers. That just gives the building more interest and this kind of sense of the old and the new together. The historic preservation aspect was important. It's a shared goal of the team, right? And we knew it was going to be very important to the entities and the agencies that were going to eventually approve what we did here anyway. They were thrilled with how it all came together. Behind that, we had a bit more flexibility. So we were able to express in a more modern way the exterior facade and to create contrast. We actually created a hyphen between the front bar and the new portion immediately behind it. We put two stairs that ran the full height of the building on either side. So they created a kind of separation. And then the echoes of the shell of the theater structure itself are expressed in the form of these big gray shells, but they don't quite touch. That kind of tension exists between the, the, the new and the old. Yeah, you can't walk into any space, you can't look at any elevation from the outside and not see something that just required really Herculean coordination, collaboration, teamwork, high-fiving, getting into it. 
the rubber met the road here. You know, we were very aware that the original school was in many, many ways a, a rabbit warren. We could definitely see how one department might not really be very aware of what was going on in the other. And so we wanted there to be visual and literal connectivity across the building. And the atrium was a device for that so that you could look across the atrium and you could see visual arts department and you could look through the windows see the students. The creation of this space really does make you feel connected. When someone's on the piano, that sound resonates through the whole building. There's something in this building that helps us push forward. It's seeping through the walls, it's in the air. They did a great job of capturing us. Here, we embrace that, take that. Take that passion, take your perception, and let's do something with it. And they executed that perfectly. The list of things that are exciting, that are were challenging, are in every corner of the building. You created a project that people are still loving, that they will love forever. We created a shrine to our founders. We created an opportunity for the next 50 years of young artists to have a place to go and grow and go out and do what we do best, and that is save the world. So thanks, Melissa, for running that. Um, I, we're obviously a little behind now. <laughs> uh, so I, I'm gonna be super brief. And before we go to Q&A, which we'll do right away, uh, I just wanted to put in a brief uh, plug for uh, if, you would, if you'd like to see Ellington, uh, you can't just walk in because of security, of course, but they have multiple productions over the year. They invite you in for those. Uh, there's one in particular coming up next month that I think is, is a very exciting one. Uh, post-classical ensemble uh, our house right there in Georgetown uh, will be doing a residency for a week at Ellington uh, partnering with the students and faculty and they will end with a production at the Ellington Theater on March 18th and I think you'll find a, a link to that certainly would love to have folks come to that so let's go to Q&A I see there's a chat and a, and a Q&A list here that we could start with yeah, um, absolutely. Well, thank you both so much for this amazing presentation. And it's so wonderful to learn more about this very complex and impressive project. So thank you so much. Um, and let me see here. Yeah, um, Anne asks, are any of the Duke Ellington resources available to other students throughout DC? They are. Um, I believe that they regularly uh, have other, uh, they invite other schools to join them. Uh, it, 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 it's primarily for its students, but I think there's a there's plenty of outreach there, uh, and there are it, it's designed for at least 600 students. I see another question up here. It, it's now pushing 600. It could accommodate more. I think that was their ideal uh, um, uh, ideal population to reach, but it, it could certainly it can certainly do more. Mm -hmm. um, and we have another question. Uh, where is the veterans plaque today? If it's, I don't know if it's still there. I believe it's still by the flagpole. Hmm. Yeah, that's where it was historic, like when it was put in. So I think it's still by the flagpole. Mm -hmm. And somebody asked a very pressing question. Good one. Uh, why didn't we just take the back building down? Well, we were already actually taking so much material out of the building that, that I would characterize as sort of secondary historic space, uh, old space that wasn't serving and didn't have a, 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 an important architectural uh, historical uh, content. We were already taking so much away that the, the one of those negotiating things we worked out with the review agencies was, we will preserve the back bar and uh, which, which has some dignity and some class to it uh, and, and we'll, we'll make it work. And as you see, have seen by the photographs, it took a lot to do that and it would have been cheaper to probably tear it down and rebuild build new. But uh, I think, again, it, it helped to preserve the overall integrity of the campus as it has evolved over its hundred and whatever years. Yeah, I would agree with that. I think Chippo um, really wanted to see as much preserved as possible. And so that was a negotiation and, and a lot of demolition happened. So in order to kind of balance that out, um, you know, portions of that back bar had to be saved. 
There's a question on slides. Did you answer that one, Alyssa? Um, I didn't. Um, if they will be available on our website, I guess that is up to you both. I think it's out there in the public already, but I'll, I can link it. Yeah, I, I awesome. will find a way to make mm -hmm. them available. Um, mm -hmm. What else do we have? <clears throat> see. Someone, someone knows the uh, building there. Yes, there were uh, two stained glass windows on, mm -hmm. what would that be? The east side. Um, and they were in the original, I think the original principal's office is, is or, or uh, some of the administrative space originally. And we did uh, uh, value those. Uh, we had to make changes to that facade and it was determined that uh, the best use of those would be to bring them inboard. Uh, and we integrated them into the entrance way from from the atrium into the uh, into the Duke Ellington School of the Arts Foundation offices. Which, by the way, that's another unique aspect of Ellington is uh, it it is uh, it part of it is a partnership with Kennedy Center and uh, uh, George Washington University, as uh, called the. Duke Ellington School of the Arts Foundation. And that's, they have separate suite of offices there. And that's where we placed these uh, stained glass windows and built them into the entrance way. Um, so you'd have to see those. You'd have to visit the building inside to see those. <laughs> um, somebody else asked, how was sustain sustainability factored into the design and execution of the project? Clearly reusing the original building was a huge win for both sustainability and historic preservation, as opposed to starting over. Uh, wonderful presentation, incredible, incredible project and design and build team. Well, sustainable, the, the basic contract required the project to be lead gold. Mm -hmm. we, we knew we would probably never reasonably get to platinum uh, for what that would mean uh, with all the restoration and renovation we had to do, but uh, so that was a that was a, a baseline, and that's not to say it wasn't easy to get there. Uh, you know, we have the gray water, we have the solar, we have the green roof. Uh, we looked at geothermal; uh, that was that was determined to be impractical. We even looked at something called wastewater. Oh, I've forgotten the name of it, but <laughs> that you could actually extract the heat from a wastewater uh, and and uh, use that. And, you know, so we 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 cast mm -hmm. the net pretty wide. Uh, and uh, but in the end, we had to make practical choices that could fit the budget and still get us uh, the sustainable uh, sustainability uh, uh, elements. And they're certainly uh, visible and obvious to the students. And uh, I believe they're made to be a part of the curriculum is to sensitize the kids to to uh, what's out there. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Um, let's see. Oh, here we go. Um, can you speak to the challenges of uh, bringing together so many uh, disciplines in a massive project like this? Great question. Well, that that is that is corralling a very complex. I mean, it. I think that you have to start out with the right team, people who've worked together for years, people who are specialists in each of their categories. You have to recognize that a project at this scale has a really large team of consultants. And the fact that uh, you're bringing in people who are specialists in, in each of their individual uh, components, uh, and you, you're not expecting to provide uh, all of that kind of thing in-house, um, that, that was the baseline, was really having an, an awesome team. And then, of course, um, having the design-build relationship with uh, GCS Siegel was, was actually, it was a little intimidating. We'd, we had not done it before. Uh, but uh, we really got in sync from day one. And, you know, they, they obviously helped. We were, we were designing, still designing while they were starting to build this thing. That's how, that's how we had to do this. Mm -hmm. And um, so they were integral in working with the consultants, bringing in specialists in the construction industry who could do things like this. And, th and that, that was, there was definitely esoteric trades here. Uh, the, the bent steel frame, for the for the skin of the egg was really an extraordinary process, I thought, and uh, you know, every everywhere you look, there was there was some really unique design and engineering and construction uh, skill. Uh, but yeah, that was 
that was a big challenge. Uh, and it was part of the excitement of the job was to have so many players. But um, I think the, the proof is in the pudding. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Um. Okay. I think anybody else have any final questions? Facebook, Zoom? Got some great questions today. Well, and people can follow up as we mm -hmm. said. Um, yeah. I think you're providing mm -hmm. uh, uh, your contact and Kim's and mine. And uh, it, also the link to the uh, uh, post-classical concert there. Um, yes. But just to close, I, it was an honor to work on the project. Uh, it's, it was the highlight of my career. Uh, and I think the people that I worked with were extraordinary uh, in their dedication uh, and, and, and power to see this thing through after five years and all the hurdles and jumps we had to do. Uh, and I'm, you know, even though it was 2017, I, I look at it. Whenever I look at it, I'm just really proud and, and happy to have been a part of it. Thanks for the opportunity. Yes, thank you so much. Yeah, thank you both so much. Um, this, again, was such a wonderful presentation, such an amazing project. Um, you know, I'm so happy to kind of learn more about just what, what went into this and especially seeing all those graphs and everything. I think we all can have like a better appreciation for all the work that goes into uh, these types of projects. Um, so yeah, so I guess, you know, real quick before we officially close things out, I do want to let everybody know what's kind of coming up for uh, DCPL. So this Saturday at the MLK Library, we're going to have a program about Elizabeth Keckley from 11 to 1 o'clock. So that's in person. It's free. It's open to the public. Um, we hope you can join us. You can learn more about that on our website. And next month is actually our last theme of DCPL's 50th anniversary celebration. So we are closing out on that. Uh, we're looking at uh, monuments and memorials in the district. So please keep an eye out uh, on what we have planned on our website, you know, social media, um, anything like that. And again, yeah, you know, let us know if you have any questions. We can pass those along to Chris and, and Kim. Their emails are in the chat, as is the link to the program. Um, and again, big thank you to you both again, and thank you to our audience for attending today. Um, I hope you all enjoy the rest of your day, and we look forward to seeing you at future programs. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.